replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, 1 Corinthians 2.14, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The man or woman without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this morning and your word. We ask that we would be led by your spirit. Lord, we need your guidance. We need your wisdom that far surpasses our own. And we ask that in this time, you would show us what you want us to see in your scripture. And that you would lead us to understand your heart for us. In all of this, in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask, uh, while you have the Bibles open, to turn, if you would, to 2 Kings 7, verses 3 through 8. We're going there next, and I'd love for you to have a, a jump on that. 2 Kings 7, verses 3 through 8. Okay, now, you'll notice I've been sneezing a lot today. For some reason, it's been allergy mayhem. So I didn't realize, but I, this whole morning, I've just been... been so I'm not sick, I'm just allergied. That's a word or a term for us. Allergized. Allergized. Thank you, Bruce. There's an illustration that I've shared before here, but I want to share it again this morning. Uh, the captain of a ship one night looked into the dark night and saw a couple of faint lights in the distance. Immediately, he told his signalman to send a message to the boat ahead of him. At alter your course 10 degrees south. Promptly, a return message was received. Alter your course 10 degrees north. The captain was angered. His command had been ignored by this other entity. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I am the captain, he replied. Soon another message was sent back to him. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I am Seaman Third Class Jones. Well, the captain got pretty upset about this response. Immediately, the captain sent a third message, knowing the fear that it would produce in Seaman Third Class Jones. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I am a battleship. Then the reply came. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I am a lighthouse. <laughs> it's funny how um, important and in control we can feel in our own lives. There are many who want full control of their lives even after they can say yes to Jesus. See, the saying yes is, yes, the most important part. But it doesn't stop there. If we're not careful when it comes to commitment or surrender, if we don't want to have God's instruction Surrendered to God's instruction in our lives, we can find ourselves in very difficult situations. We can crash, as it were. And many feel that the best way to live is to say yes to Jesus, yet to stay in control of their own lives for themselves. And we live in a place, in a time, in a culture where marketing is very focused on people having things their own way. Anyone aware of that? Burger King's number one line for years was, 
We, anyone else know this? Have it your way, right? We know this. Uh, there's a car ad that came on. It said, come to, I uh, was called like, Umbra Toyota, where it's all about you. And the Umbra's got the big the U's all like blown up. You get it? I thought it was clever at the time. But we like that. I want to go somewhere, especially if I'm going to spend my money and have it be my way, all about me. It's like Frank Sinatra, right? I did it. Yes. It's a good song. It's really a good song. I mean, it's not good in life with Jesus, but that's a good song of its own, on its own. But Adrian Rogers tells a story about a conversation he had with a man from Romania named Yosef Tassan. And he said this. I thought it was really good. He said, when you make a commitment, you are still in control no matter how noble the thing you commit to. One can commit to pray, to study the Bible, to give money, to make automobile payments, or to lose weight. Whatever he or she does, they commit to. But surrender is different. If someone holds a gun to your head and says surrender, you don't tell them what you're committed to. You put your hands up and give them what they want. Do we see the difference? Letting go of our right to be in control is surrender. And for many, it's the most difficult of concepts when it comes to the Christian faith. I, I have heard many sermons and I have seen many places in church where they say, here is some information, now you decide. And it is right for us to decide, but we have to, de we have to be clear in what influences what we decide. Does that make sense? We have to be clear in what influences what we decide. Is it the Word of God? Is it the heart of God? Is it, is it living out things in a way that glorify the God whose we are? Or is it about something else? There are always temptations to compromise. In fact, I would say to you that oftentimes it's a lot easier to not be led by God's word and truth in how we live. But that's just commitment. I commit to follow Jesus as long as I think it's good. I took a class with a guy named Dr. Um, Richard Mao, who was the, the president of Fuller Seminary for a number of years, and he taught a class called uh, Christ and Culture, and they did a survey and a study of, um, at the time, Gen X was young, not, not so much anymore, but back then Gen X was young, and they did a, sur they did a survey of a lot of, of, uh, of young, young Gen Xers at the time, and a lot of them said that they really liked this concept, I'm not going to give you the, 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 the theological term for it, where you pick and choose what you want. So you can have someone who believes in Buddha, someone who believes in Wicca, but yet someone who knows that God answers prayer. And you can put it all in the smorgasbord of, of, of belief systems that actually contradict each other, and it's considered acceptable, and, they, and it's just part of the New Age spirituality. And a lot of people feel really good about doing that. The only problem is, is that for the Christian, if we're not led by God's truth, we're able to fall for anything else. And I've known a lot of really good people who have fallen for a worldly perspective as opposed to a biblical truth. Anyone ever seen that happen before? It's common, especially in our culture, especially in our city. And so this idea of commitment or surrender is really a big deal when it comes to life with Christ. And so we come to our, our next passage here, a very, a very neat passage, a very um, somewhat of an unknown passage for a lot of folks, 2 Kings 7, verses 3 through 8. So just to give you a little bit of background into what's going on here, um, Samaria is being uh, besieged by the Armenian army. Ar no, Aramean, sorry. I always listen to you. 
Yeah, I know, I know. I, not the Armenians. Arameans. <laughs> so the Arameans are a great worldly power. They've come and they have besieged Samaria. Um, food is incredibly high. In fact, in the passage before um, this part of the scripture, there was a, a, the king of Samaria was going through and found that a woman had ate her own child. Ew, bad. So it's that desperate in Samaria. There is that little food in the city as the um, Aramean army is besieging, um, Israel, is besieging Samaria, the city in Israel. Remember, there were two kingdoms. There was Judah and there was Samaria, the northern and southern kingdoms, after Solomon died. They split. The kingdoms of, of Israel split. And so Samaria, the northern kingdom, is the one that's being besieged. And Elijah is the prophet there. So 2 Kings 7, 3 through 8. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we will live. If they kill us, we will die. Good options, right? At dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dust and abandoned their tents and their horses and their donkeys. They left the camp and it was as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp and entered one of the tents. They ate and drank and carried away silver and gold and cloth and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. So we see these four lepers. Now how many of us know lepers in this culture, that was a bad thing to be? If you touch the leper back then, you got leprosy. So none of the people wanted lepers around. They were basically left to beg at the gates, and people would come by and throw money into a plate and, and avoid all contact. That was how lepers were treated. So we see these, these guys that are here. They're all the verge of starvation. And they identify for themselves three possible plans of going forward. The first one is retreat, verse 4. We'll go into the city, the famine is there, and we will die. There's no food for them in the city. No one is giving food to beggars in a place where there's no food. So they look at the first option. Go back to where we've been before. They knew there was no life in where they'd been before, only death. We know that in our walk, with God, if we go back, there is no life, only death. Where we've come from was a precursor to where we are right now. God continues to call us forward. Spiritual death awaits those who choose to go backwards. So there's that first option of retreat. And we think about the things that we have come from, where we've been before, life where we lived out um, sin, old habits that, that chipped away at our spiritual lives, a, a, a not knowing of God, a not knowing of His Spirit, an unawareness of His truth. That's all what we've come from. But there's always an invitation to turn from God and go back to it. Remember in Proverbs it says the foolish person is like a dog who returns to their vomit. There are people who find the goodness of God, but find the cost too great to follow Him. They find salvation in Christ, they understand what that looks like, and they choose to go back. That happens in the Christian faith. The second option is that they can remain. Verse 3, they said to each other, Why stay here until we die? And if we stay here, we will die. 
They could have stayed where they were. They didn't have to do anything. What happens if we stay stagnant in our faith? That's not like fun to anybody? Oh, you know, when I was 16, I had this great experience with God. I, was, I, I, I felt him talk to me, and, I was, and the Bible came alive, and it was so great. And from every year after that, I'm just going to celebrate when I was 16. And that's the limit of where I'm going to go. And so we take this approach that says, oh, we can't do that new thing. We don't do new things in our life. Right? I mean, can you imagine if someone came to you and said, hey, stop taking notes and put them in a, in a, in a big file. We have these things called computers. Oh, no, no. When I was 16, we didn't use computers. I'm not going to try those now. Is that, doesn't it seem funny? Yet, we can do that in our faith. Oh, I can't learn a new song. I can only sing songs I sang when I was 16. Oh, I can't, I can't believe that God can do more than I, than I believed for at 16 or 20 or whatever it was. And pretty soon we can close off the, the ability to see that God wants to do something new. And churches become famous for this. Not us, but churches. They do it the same way they did it 50, 60 years ago. And someone says, hey, what about this? No, no, no. Not at our church. We don't do it that way. And churches die. Because they're not willing to move forward when God is doing something new. They want to stay where they've always been. Christians can do the same thing. And why do we not move forward? Usually it's because of fear, right? It's scary to, to, to be open to new things. It's scary to try something that we've never done before. But that fear can cripple us and keep us from experiencing more with God. If we stay here, we will die, the men say. The third option, move forward into the unknown. Move forward into the unknown. At dusk, they got up and they went to the camp of the Arameans, not the Armenians, Nancy. I'm watching that. The, Ar the Arameans, when they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there, for the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, and they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel had hired the Hittite and the Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dust and abandoned their tents and their horses and their donkeys. They left the camp and it was, and as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp and entered one of the tents. They ate and drank and carried away silver and gold and clothes and went off and hid them also. Because they were willing to go into the unknown, they found great abundance and life. Not only that, these four lepers came back to the city that was starving to death and told them the, the Arabian army was gone and everyone came out and got food. The easy thing would have been to stay where they were or go back to where they had been and they would have died for sure, but because they were willing to go forward, they found not only enough food to eat, but an abundance of new things that blessed their lives. They weren't sure of the future but they took a step of faith and God intervened and provided for them when they were not afraid to move forward. In moving forward, also, moving forward into the unknown also allows God to do something that maybe He's never done before in our lives. If I play it safe in my life, in my faith, in my Christian walk, 
if I never try anything new, again, new in terms of the scriptures and the spirit, not something crazy, I can't allow God to show me what is possible in areas that I don't know about. Make sense? And I believe that more than anything, God wants to continue to increase our understanding of what it means to rely upon Him. Of what it means to see Him do the incredible, the impossible, or even the possible that we haven't yet been able to do before for ourselves. You see, God didn't save us so that we could be comfortable with where we're at. He saved us so that we could grow in areas and things we haven't yet seen and accomplished and come into. And it doesn't stop. There's never a time in life where it stops. There's a continual invitation to more, to greater. And that's what makes life with God so amazing if we understand it from a biblical perspective. If we practice being in his presence daily, being in his word, being in worship, saying, look, in the scripture, he did these things. Could these things apply to my life? We pray and say, Lord, are you inviting me to something I haven't done before? And he tells us. And I'll tell you what, sometimes we're more afraid of him telling us than not hearing from him at all. Does that make sense? What if he says to you, I want you to start volunteering at the homeless shelter once a week? Some of us are scared to death of that. That's not fun. I mean, it, it can be fun, but it can be scary. It is fun. I, I think it's fun. But the first time that I went, I was scared. The lady started walking, the lady, the lady walked up to us. She started, she had more expletives and more bad language than I have heard in a long time. You know? And she didn't smell good. And we're called to say, hey, even though you have got really bad language and you're scary and you don't smell well, I want to love on you. I mean, for people that don't know Jesus, that's nuts. I just write a check. No, I'm serious. You know, and God challenges us in a lot of ways because he wants us to have a fuller experience of him. Maybe the challenge is to love on that person in your family or your workplace or your life that's a real pain in the tush. No, I mean, that could be the invitation. That, that family member who you just want to strangle and say, now God wants you to love on them. And so sometimes we're, we're more scared of what God's going to call us to than not hearing from him at all. But I promise you that if we trust and if we're willing to hear if you're willing to surrender to God and say, God, what do you want to do? What are you saying? And I want to live that out. I promise that in the end, even though it's uncomfortable, we grow. Good comes out of that. I mean, that's good. We don't help others to feel good about ourselves. We help others because we want people to see God glorified. We want people to understand who God is better because they were in touch with us. But we have to be prioritizing time with Him. Reading Scripture to learn, not reading the Scripture to see if we agree with it or not. That's a big difference. If we're willing to yield to Jesus in surrender and take up more of him, we'll be different people. And that's the invitation. He'll go with us as far as we want to go. You know, the good news is that at the end, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When he comes again, there's not going to be an option. But up until that time, we have a choice. And it's a great choice. After death, there are no options. We're just up in heaven, and it's worship, and it's glory, and it's the best existence anyone will ever know. But we get to choose at this point in life how much we want the Lord in our lives and what it looks like 
for us. Are we going to go forward? Are we going to stay where we're at? Or are we going to go back? Because the cost is too great. Those are the options that we all have. And I love that God created us and loves us and gives us a choice. He's a God that always gives us a choice. If he controlled us into making the decisions that would lead to all the abundance, it's not love, it's control. And how many of us know that God made us because he loves us? Right. We're his children. We're his, we're his, we were created by him for relationship with him. But relationship with him has to be our choice. Otherwise, it's not love. It's just control. It's a good truth. Let's close in prayer. And Lord, for each of us, this means something different. We're not all called to the same thing. But we are called to surrender to you, to your spirit, and to your word. And we thank you, God, that that is your truth. That is your desire for us. That we, every day, would wake up choosing you over everything else. And Lord, we thank you for the reality that if we do choose you over everything else, you provide all that we need. Because that's who you are. But that first and initial surrender is a very hard one. And Lord, for many of us, it takes many years of constantly saying, we choose you over the other things. But God, thank you. Thank you that we have the opportunity. Thank you that you give us the choice. Thank you that even though we see people who reject you succeeding in terms of the world's material possessions, we still get to make that choice for you in the midst of every circumstance. And Lord, as we choose you, grow us. Grow us as your sons and daughters. It's a great journey. Like children who grow from one, two, and three, or four-year-old to adulthood, there is much for us to learn and much for us to trust you for and to rely on you for. God, I pray that you would put seeds in each of our hearts for you, for your word, for your spirit, for the things of your kingdom, that as we run after you, as we, as we make that third choice to go into the unknown, because that's where you are, and that's where we meet you, and find you, and see you prove all the truth and all the miracles to us. I pray that there would be great joy and great encouragement, and that you would give each of us a perspective that has you bigger than the world's circumstances. Where you are bigger, Lord, we have the truth that you are in control. The enemy has been defeated. The keys are not with him anymore. Lord, help us to live in light of that truth. And Lord, to find you in all the ways that you invite us, to look different from every other person's, because our individual journey is different. But Lord, help us to find and see you your purposes, your plans for our lives, and the joy that comes from surrender in the face of commitment. We pray these things, Lord Jesus, in your holy name. Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. Thank you.